afternoon. Uh, my name is Benjamin Brooks. I am the Director of Programming and Visual Communications for the Chicago Council on Science and Technology. Thank you very much for attending today's program. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Gregory Voff, who is uh, the Papazian Distinguished Service Professor for Chemistry at the University of Chicago, as well as the Director for the Center of Multiscale Theory and Simulation. Um, we're really happy. We've been planning this program for a long time, uh, I think over a year. Yep. Yeah. And uh, we're very pleased and excited to hear what uh, Dr. Wolf has got to say. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's almost spring outside, so, uh, so uh, thanks for coming in on a beautiful day. I'm going to talk about computers and how computers have changed how we do chemistry, biology, that's what uh, the title means. But before I get into my seminar, I want to show you a paper, since we're from the Chicago area. This is <clears throat> the beginning of it all. Uh, did you know, you knew him. Did you know Anise Rockman? He was, I think he, he left there in the 80s. This uh, paper, which is going on 50 years old, was the, the first serious use of a computer to simulate uh, matter. In this case, something very simple, which was liquid argon. Argon, very simple liquid, just atoms. And Anise Rockman had the courage to do this on a computer that uh, pales in comparison to the power of this iPhone. Okay, And I won't go through all this, but the science in this is tour de force. If this, he unfortunately died early from cancer. But this man will get a Nobel Prize today if he were alive. It, it's, it's a phenomenal... Uh, piece of work and came from our local area and our, our beloved national laboratory. So, okay, so let me tell you about what I, I'm going to talk about today. Um, I think we're all familiar with uh, this kind of thing. This is a, probably your kids or your grandkids play with these, the PlayStations. Uh, these are two different ones. I've actually never used them before. Um, uh, but inside of them is phenomenal computing power, so par powerful that you probably don't appreciate that. And so what I want to talk to you about today is how having this sort of power at our fingertips, plus a, a core knowledge of the science, of the physics, of the chemistry, has sort of transformed a field, uh, transformed, I, I would argue, what has transformed the scientific method. And, um, and that's what I mean by molecular modeling. And I'm going to uh, finish my talk today talking about how this kind of work may have something very valuable to tell us about HIV infection and how HIV uh, works. So I'm going to talk about generally what we do, uh, the larger context of it, and finish with the specific applications of, of some things that we've been studying to show you sort of where it goes. Now, <clears throat> what we do is what's called computer simulation. And uh, computer simulation is different than computer animation. Right? And I, I have to really emphasize this. What you're looking at here is uh, some graphic from a, a, a video game. Lord knows there's horrendous murders going on here and other things, okay? But uh, these are amazing things. And if you just look at one of these games or a movie that you watched 15 years ago, it's incredible how this has uh, changed just, just in this sense. Computer simulation is not this. A computer simulation is the solving of the equations of physics to generate behavior Okay, not things you've hardwired into it that you want to watch and animate, but you're trying to discover. Okay, that's what a computer simulation is, and it's very different from computer animation. And in fact, uh, the thing that we share in common is the ability to use these computers to um, uh, transform sets of equations that describe things. In, in this case, uh, there's a set of equations, these meshes that describe how this uh, sort of robotic character moves, and the computer can do this so much faster than our brain can, and so you can animate. Well, it turns out that going back to World War II, the Manhattan Project, uh, actually in the Manhattan Project, they used adding machines. <laughs> they didn't have digital computers, so they were cranking away. They, were, they, they had you know, world-famous scientists in, in a room like this cranking away with adding machines doing bomb calculations. And then shortly thereafter, uh, the digital computers came along, and Anise Rockman uh, picked up on that in the early 60s of these simulations. So they, they discovered that you could take those computers and uh, solve very hard equations. You know, equations that Isaac Newton wrote down, or Schrodinger, uh, that you can solve in certain 
limiting cases, but often we just stare at these equations, we don't know what to do with them. So this has really transformed our scientific method. I, I could probably get an argument on this, but the, the sort of traditional scientific method uh, works, and I don't mean to offend your intelligence if you know this, bro, is, you know, we have a set of experimental facts. You always begin and end an experiment. Even though I'm a big computer simulator, I'd be the first to tell you, without experiment, uh, we're in real trouble. So you have some facts and you formulate a theory that explains that set of facts, but then you have to predict new behavior that you then go and measure experimentally and, and sort of iterate, and that's the scientific methodology. What computation has allowed us to do is um, to add a third sort of tier in this, a triad. It's an adjunct to our brain because a computer is not a, a, a creative thing, right? A computer is a powerful thing that just churns away at stuff that our brain could never do that. And it plugs into both these in very major way. The, the ability to do computer simulation allows us to greatly expand our uh, ability to solve these equations, the equations that describe the, the behavior of nature, and to interpret our experiments. Most of people don't even realize that experimental data comes in in masses. It gets fed into computers and processed, often uh, in ways you, know, you don't even understand. Then you pick up the cover of science or nature, and you read about this beautiful thing. You don't realize how much computer calculation went in it. So this has connected these scales in a very big way. Um, the other, so, so things have evolved in, in the connection between theory and simulation, the connection between simulation and experiment. What also has evolved beyond just the little computers, right, the individual processors, are these massively powerful computers. Uh, this one is now outdated. 150,000 processors, okay, being replaced by one, this is an argon, being replaced by one with 800,000 processors, and the processors are faster. I think a factor five times faster, I can't. And what this allows us to do is solve these equations uh, that describe the physics in, in untold ways to describe how molecules associate and behave. And this is a picture of some proteins, um, and I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. So computer simulation um, allows us to make a, 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 a movie, if you will, but it's a movie describing what the laws of physics tell us. It's not a movie where we tell the computer, okay, we want the, this figure to run and shoot this figure or do this or that. It is, we don't know what's going to happen. We know the equations, we feed them in, and we solve uh, those equations. There's a lot that goes to this. I'll show you. This is a little movie of a computer simulation. What, what this shows is there's a, a cell membrane here, a lot of the blue. There's a protein. All these, these helices go through the membrane. And you'll see a, a small molecule being transported through that. And this could be a molecule that's essential for the behavior of the cell. It could be a drug molecule. It could be a number of things. A real-world application, by the way, are what we call uh, multi-drug transporters. Bacteria have these things in there. Bacteria are nasty little things. I'm sure you would agree we're in a hospital. We, we you know, lots of that around probably somewhere. Um, they have these things that spit out drugs. <laughs> You, you, you feed the bacteria a drug to kill it, and they're really smart. They know how to shoot it out. And this is a, a simulation of this. Um, kind of a, a neat one. You'll see there's the, the molecule going through, interacting with other parts of the protein, and, and so on and so forth. The question is, uh, how do you do this? What's behind it? And that's what I want to explain to you today. All right? the, the, the steps taken to being able to get to that are very, very complicated, um, and that's what I want to explain to you. So, hope we don't want to see that again. Sorry about that. What I'm going to end up with today is showing how, uh, with new conceptual ideas, we can actually push what we do to reach um, scales that we never dreamed of reaching before. This is the HIV virus, and these are called virions, so that is like a little membrane, a little piece of the cell this little encapsulated object inside of there is a lot of proteins, protein molecules, that are encasing the genetic material of the virus. And this little monster is the thing that transmits the virus between cells. So it's called the HIV virion. And I'm going to finish my talk showing about how the combination of the computer power and the, the conceptual ideas that we uh, are developing um, allow us to really approach problems of this scale, far more complicated than the one I just showed you. And I have to give a brief advertisement uh, for my 
center that I'm a director of, the National Science Foundation, has funded what's called a phase one center for chemical innovation at the University of Chicago. It's devoted to pushing the frontiers of computer simulation, of being able to do what we study in, in you know, tenfold more than before. And, and it involves this term multi-scale. The, the multi-scale term is a critical thing because everything we care about in nature is very complex. It, it starts with scales of individual molecules, but then they assemble into very complex structures, ultimately going to cell and so forth. So what we uh, are trying to, to figure out how to do is to start from the molecular scale and push these techniques of computer simu simulation, at least up to the cellular scale. This is, of course, organ scale, and this is whole organism or human scale. Uh, this is probably you know, going all the way, and my lifetime, I think, will occur. But right now, we're just trying to push up to the scale of cells. You see their red blood cells being shown. And so what do we do? What, how do we do it? That's the, the key question here. Well, we have to... Uh, figure out how to model these systems using what we know about physics, uh, how to uh, develop models that are tractable, that, believe it or not, as powerful as these computers are, and they're very powerful, uh, the, the real complexity in nature is phenomenally more complicated. So there's a, a set of steps of, of taking the known laws of physics, simplifying them enough that we can actually do these calculations. And once we are able to do that, we can study things like how proteins, the things that make up uh, much of our, of our bodies, how they change their shape, their function when bad things happen, like cancer or other forms of disease, how they behave unnaturally. And this all begins and ends with the, the ability to sort of uh, solve the physics. This is a picture of a, of a liquid. This is a simple liquid, kind of like Anise Rachman did back in 1964, but this is a molecular liquid. Liquid, I have to confess to you, I'm not sure what liquid is. It looks like water, but normally we color oxygen red and hydrogen uh, either white, but it looks to me like water. So the idea is how would we model something as simple as that, and once we've done that, can we go to the next step and study proteins and uh, nucleic acids and beyond? Well, <clears throat> it turns out we can't uh, take a direct attack on this. What we have to do is we have to develop models for the underlying molecules. So for example, this is water. Uh, water, you can see the oxygen and the hydrogen are sort of represented in this graphical depiction that doesn't represent anything real. In reality, we have nuclei and we have electrons that are floating around or some fuzzy object, but we develop a sort of a mechanical looking object that we have to use to describe how they interact with each other. So we start by defining connectivity, bondedness. And certainly we know that chemical bonds exist, right? So this is a bond between oxygen and hydrogen. And there's two of those in water. And then it has some geometry. And then we have to um, uh, go forward with figuring out how to solve that. How do they interact with each other? How do they uh, uh, satisfy the equations of physics that we know need to be solved? Here's an example or some pictures of really far more complicated structures. Here's a small amino acid. It looks a little bit like that water structure, but there's more atoms involved with chemical bonding. Here's proteins, uh, you know, with all kinds of things like helices and different structures we call loops, represented in two different ways here. And ultimately, as we push forward to understand this, the scales of biology, we have to look at lots of proteins interacting together. This is a small little piece of what's called an actin filament. An actin filament is a key part of cells. And you can see there's, in this, I think there's 13 of the proteins stuck together and they move. I'll, I'll show you some of this. So where do we start? Well, going back to how the scientific method works, we need experiments. And a revolution, in the, certainly in the 20th century, has been structural biology. I, I don't know if you've had a lecture on structural biology, but structural biology, uh, it was understood that if you could crystallize uh, proteins, complex molecules, they don't have to be proteins, you can scatter x-rays from them, and you get diffraction patterns. And this uh, set of diffraction patterns will tell you about the sort of static average structure of the molecule, of the bondedness. And so it tells you how a complex species like this, with all the carbons and oxygens and everything, folds into a structure. 
there's a many challenges with structural biology. Some many proteins don't crystallize. And so there's whole uh, um, ranges of them that we don't have great information on, but many do. And there's a huge data bank of them, them called the protein data bank that's got these structures. Increasingly, we have new techniques also. Uh, one is called cryo-electron microscopy, where they don't use x-rays, they use uh, electrons to scatter. And what they do is they take structures from cells and flash freeze them very quickly so that it kind of captures it in the state, and then they uh, uh, scatter these electrons and get uh, electron density. So these are pictures of these actin filaments. They're usually lower resolution, but what's important about them is they tell us about lots of these proteins interacting with each other. So we, we use those um, structures. And once we uh, do that, once we have the structure, now we have to go to what we call the dynamics. Things don't just sit there, right? I mean, I'm not sitting here. They move. And they move due to the forces of nature, due to chemical gradients in our bodies. There's ATP that drives our, our motion. There's uh, all kinds of things. So uh, we have to deal with this thing of making them move. And the question is, how do they move? Well, um, here's a, a picture of a, an example. This is a, 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 what's called a permease. It's a protein that transports stuff through the cell membrane. It kind of moves like a clam. Okay, you can see in this it sort of grabs this thing it wants to transport. It has a big change in its conformation, so it kind of ro rotates like this, and so this can be discharged. And so this motion, we need to figure out how we're going to do that. And that's where what I'm telling you about today comes in. Okay, you, getting this information of how they move is very, very difficult experimentally. There are techniques to do it. Um, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance can give you some uh, sort of information on motion. Um, spectroscopy, probing with light can do that, imaging. But simulation has come in in a huge way to do this. So, so how do we do that? Well, <clears throat> let's go back to water. What water really is is, of course, oxygen and hydrogen. With some, and this is, you know, uh, 1800s uh, or early, early 1900s picture of electrons orbiting these nuclei, it's all wrong, right? But, but the idea is that actually we, we have to understand how to represent this, how to represent this quantum mechanics. What we'd love to be able to do is to solve this very seemingly simple looking equation, which is the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is the law of quantum mechanics. And that would tell us everything, okay? But it's impossible to solve this equation for a huge system like a protein. It, it, we can solve it for pieces and um, map sort of what it tells us about pieces like water or parts of the proteins into something simpler. And what is simpler is uh, what we attribute to Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton told us, told us F equals MA. Isaac Newton didn't know about quantum mechanics, so if Isaac Newton uh, uh, had known about quantum mechanics, he probably would have given up on F equals MA. Isaac Newton was interested in planets and things moving around. It turns out that at this, in biology and sort of much of chemistry at our temperature that we live, uh, these, these very complex quantum mechanical properties, except those involving the electrons, are not so important that we can actually get away using what Isaac Newton told us. What we have to figure out how to do is to take what quantum mechanics tells us about electrons and map it into something that Isaac Newton could use, basically. And so that is what we call a molecular model. So what we do is we take these objects. Again, I'm, I'm just focusing on, on uh, water, okay, because it's the simplest picture I can show you. And we start building little Newtonian-like objects. You can imagine that these chemical bonds between the oxygen and the hydrogen, that they vibrate just like a spring. In fact, they do. Experimentally, if you probe that with spectroscopy, with sending in light, you'll see absorption of light where this thing vibrates. Uh, the bending, it vibrates, this, this here. And also, we know that water is a, a wonderful solvent. It's something that dissolves salt. It, it uh, solvates proteins. And because of the quantum mechanics, going back here, these electrons, on average, sort of have a distribution due to these wave functions that tell us about the net charge distribution here. Because, of course, the nuclei are positively charged. The electrons are negatively charged. We represent that by a model in which there are partial charges. So instead of having a, a complex distribution of electron density from solving quantum mechanics, we represent it um, by uh, points. 
that have partial charge, so partial positive charge, partial negative charge, and uh, so on and so forth. And you can really prove that there are very systematic ways to do this that take what quantum mechanics tell us, translate them into this kind of a model. The only thing that's left to do is what uh, Rachman figured out a long time ago, is to integrate these equations of motion. It's one thing to have a model. We now have to integrate F equals MA. So um, how do you do it? You, you use a, a, a simple mathematical formula called an integrator. It's, uh, it's solving these, these differential equations discreetly every time step. So you feed the computer information. The computer um, uh, you, wants to know an acceleration and a velocity and a time step, how much I move the system. And this updates the, the position and the velocity. This simple little set of mathematical equations that you feed into the computer, the accelerations come from the forces generated by these things interacting with each other. So the so-called potential energy function, the forces. And, and you just do this millions and millions and millions of times. A typical time step, that's where the computer comes in. The computer can do that kind of stuff far, far uh, more powerfully than we can. And of course, this is for a you know, huge number of particles interacting with each other. Typically, this time step is a femtosecond, so 10 to the minus 15th second. Typically, we want to look at things at least a nanosecond, 10 to the minus 9th second, or up to seconds. So even to get to a nanosecond, it's a million calculations, right, that computer has to do. And I'll show you, this is a snapshot of, um, of water. So there it is. This is the, the offshoot. You're kind of, you know, the, the graphics programs will let you feel like you're actually in the water. And the water is, uh, is floating around. And uh, even this simulation, I don't want to digress too much, but you know, these simulations have led people to all kinds of interesting uh, discoveries about water. And to this very day, we do not have a perfect model for water that recapitulates all of the known experimental properties of water. Can you believe that? I mean, the single most important substance, if you will, liquid on Earth, we as the, as the theorists, uh, as the experimentalists, as the scientists, we don't have a complete understanding of it, right? Um, and by that, I mean its, its average structure, its phase behavior, why it melts, where it melts, and, and so on and so forth. So that's a huge challenge, but um, I'll, I'll have to uh, bypass that. So what else can we calculate then? Once we have these simulations going, once we can generate forces from a model and solve them on a computer, we can start exploring stuff. We can start, this is, um, I think it moved already. It's a protein, let me come back and do it again. This is the static picture that you get from uh, something like the, the, the crystal structure database. This is how it actually moves in terms of allowing things to come in and, and have chemical reactions. We can begin to understand stuff like the, the fundamental forces that drive biological uh, energy, ATP hydrolysis. So the, here are an ATP molecule undergoing hydrolysis. This figure that we can calculate from just, just pounding away on the computer tells us about the energies on average of these different structures. The, the red is a higher energy, so these regions along these two variables that describe these conformations are very high energy. You'll notice that we start from a negative number and, and red is near zero, so deep colors are very, very low energy. So these basins tell us about how the thing starts and how it ends and how it gets there, how it actually reacts. And this is really important. Um, this is one of the fundamental things in life, but the you know, a, a, a molecule that we work on in, in my research group is a, a protein called hydrogenase that produces hydrogen. So if we could understand how it does that, it could be a way for doing alternative uh, energy production. We may also calculate how uh, proteins uh, bind to each other based on their electrostatic surface. This is a projection of, once you understand, these are many, many atoms in here. So this is an actin filament. This is another actin filament, and this is a junction. There's a special protein called ARP23 that binds in here and, and lets it have a junction, and that spreads out these actin networks. The reason they bind with each other is because there's electrostatics from the distribution of charge that define a very complex surface. So the, 
The red, I think, is the most positive charge, and the blue is the most negative. And, and the way that is and the way it moves defines how these bind to each other. We can also do uh, more exotic things. I'll show you a couple of movies. Um, in your cells, uh, there's a process called endocytosis about how things are taken into the cells. And there's a, a number of proteins that help with that. So this is a, cell, a pe little piece of a cell membrane. These proteins are called n domain proteins. They're kind of shaped like a banana. And they, they bind to one side of the cell membrane, and they cause big changes. Now, in, in the cell, it's extremely difficult to follow what goes on here, so we do experiments in test tubes. So we do in vitro experiments. We take membranes, usually it's big bubbles of uh, cell membranes, just a, uh, it looks like a big bubble. We put these proteins in, and we try to understand how they change the membrane. I'll show you a couple of computer simulations of doing that. Now, these are not animations. Again, this is based on the real physics of how these proteins interact with the cell membrane. And um, we found something kind of interesting. This is stuff that's current science. It's under review. At low density, I'm going to try to play this movie here. So that, that's a big bubble. This is a, a big bubble of cell membrane. These are the proteins binding to it. They begin to introduce really strong deformations. Now, that spinning, by the way, is an animation. That's not a simulation. There's nothing that caused that thing to spin naturally. We were just showing you. What we found is that as you increase the density of these proteins, they actually start creating interesting structures like this that are these string-like structures, and then they form kind of a noose causing the bubble to have a bubble. So this is a, what we call a bud. And we think that, in fact, this is a, a discovery using these computers of, that tells us about how endocytosis might start, that these proteins are recruited to start bending the cell membrane, and that that helps it take in uh, objects into the cell. And this is extremely hard to verify by experiment, because experiments can only do things at very high density of proteins. And I'll show you a, a simulation at high density. Things are totally different. This is uh, all a, a lot of these proteins on this bubble of cell membrane. Look what happens when I do my computer. Oops, didn't want to do that, sorry. After all these years of doing these simulations and this is totally different behavior. You see how it tears apart that bubble? And it, it forms uh, wrappings of the proteins around cell membrane pieces and does what we call tubulate the membrane. And in fact, experimentally, this is seen. These are some snapshots from our simulations. And these are experiments from my uh, uh, colleague, Vinzenz Unger, at Northwestern. They, they take these things, they smash them on a, on a grid, and they do electron microscopy, so they look flattened. This is an impurity here. I don't know exactly what it is, but you can see the structures are very similar, but it's totally different than what we saw here. Okay, so um, let me sort of finish the, the last half of the talk telling you where all of this science is headed, because that's probably the most interesting thing. Everything that I told you about um, is, is, has become a very well-defined field for the last, let's say, 40 years. Doing these molecular models, solving them on a computer, uh, doing increasingly big calculations. But the scale of biology up here, this is a picture of a cell. These are all these actin filaments in here. Protein, you know, many, you know, thousands, millions of proteins stuck together forming complex organization. This is way beyond the power of any computer that we have, or really any that we can dream of. Uh, down here is an individual actin protein, which I've sort of talked about several times here. This is a little piece of a filament, of one of these little filaments, about 13 of them. Already, when you do a computer simulation of this, um, resolving every single atom, so trying to build one of these models so that Isaac Newton's equations can be applied to it, you hit a million atoms. And, and, of course, the time scales here are, are far beyond a nanosecond. The time scales that are important are at least a millisecond, if not seconds or hours. So making this jump to here to here is a huge um, theoretical challenge, not a computational challenge. In part, it is, but it's a theoretical challenge. This involves a new concept, which uh, we call coarse graining. So we didn't invent the term, but we're really pushing this in our center in a very big way. The idea of coarse graining... <clears throat> 
is that, you know, you really don't need to know what every single atom is doing, okay? At this scale, you can't possibly resolve, at my scale, I mean, does it matter how, what each of my atoms is doing? So there's a natural scale reduction when you go up in scale, yet the behavior here really does depend on what's going down in here. In particular, in here is the ATP molecule that's being hydrolyzed by an enzymatic reaction here, which modulates how these filaments behave. So it, they're coupled. They, they know what's going on down here, but you don't need to actually look at every single atom to sort of explore this. The coarse graining idea is, is a is really relatively new concept. It is to take atomistic information and to make it simpler, okay? So to transform something like this, which is every atom resolved, I'm looking at every atom, into something that looks kind of like a tinker toy model here. You can see what I've done here is I've represented whole pieces of this protein. Remember that, that looping thing here is lots of atoms bonded together into a molecule. I've represented them by an object that, that describes all of them. So this is what we call, a, a, for some reason, I don't know the reason, we call it a bead. I guess it looks like a bead. It looks like a, some sort of a bead in some sort of little toy. That bead represents all of those objects, uh, all of that protein, this, that part of the protein, and so, so on and so forth. And you can do different levels of this coarse grain modeling. What this does for you, if you do it well, is it, it's a, a bridge. It's an intermediate bridge between the molecular world and the sort of mesoscopic world, if you will. And it's dramatically more efficient to solve the equations behind this uh, to push up into the scale. And I'll, I'll finish today with, with the, the a application to HIV infection. The, the hard part is how, you know, remember I told you about the molecular modeling, about how we take a single water molecule and kind of represent what quantum mechanics does by a simpler model. This, you can see, is going to be a much greater challenge. We're trying to represent by a simplified object what is going on with this protein, and that really in some way just needs to be translated into this model. You can't just cook up some toy. You have to translate the real physics, and that's, I'm not going, you know, don't let this next slide scare you. It's designed to scare you. This is what we're doing in our center. You know, I'm not gonna explain any of it to you, but it's a, a incredibly, integrated set of theoretical concepts and computational concepts and everything to be able to, to pull off this sort of paradigm shift, if you will, in our modeling. And if we're successful, it will have great impact. Uh, for example, not just in biology, another example, a lot of this kind of work has been done at Northwestern. They're, they're really tremendously, uh, Northwestern and Evanston, the Evanston campus, tr tremendous pioneers up there in nanoscience. So here, uh, is an example, you have these little gold nanoparticles, and they've linked it together, interestingly enough, by DNA. See that DNA, that double helix? But you can make interest, you can make sort of different junctions, different structure of these junctions, which will assemble into different crystals. So this is another example of this multi-scale problem that we really, it really matters, these molecular level, but to get up here, you can't do it directly. So if these techniques we develop are successful, we can make that scale bridge. At Argonne, and also actually in my own research group, we're interested in renewable energy. Uh, so fuel cell. Fuel cell is a, is a thing that basically is splitting water. Okay, it's, it's, it's utilizing that energy. There's a membrane in between the anode and the cathode of the fuel cell that has to transport protons, so acid. And that membrane is very complicated. It has some strange structural organization at what we call the mesoscale that we don't really understand. At the, at the molecular scale, there's acid. There's proton flowing around. Acid, very low pH, very acidic. But at this scale, we have strange channels and morphology. So again, going from here to here is a real challenge, and we'll never be able to improve the performance of fuel cells until we can do that. So we have, um, we have an example, again, where these techniques are far beyond biology. So let me finish with... Um, with the HIV. This is a fun sort of case story. We don't have the answer. We work with some of the best structural and molecular biologists in the world on this, and we, we contribute, you know, a, just a piece of it. Um, in HIV, I, I showed you that there's this viral particle, and this is a, a kind of a, a more of an artist's rendition of it. There's an outer shell, which has been a, a piece of cell membrane that came off. There's a lot of junk floating around here, which I'll tell you about in a bit. And there's that, uh, that in encapsulated shell of the nucleic acid inside. So there's these proteins. And, 
With the techniques that we've developed, we've just recently been able to start addressing uh, this problem, this scale of problem. And so we hope to be able to make a difference in HIV. I guess this is the usual spiel. Uh, having worked on HIV uh, enough, I'm certainly not an HIV expert. Anyone who thinks that it's cured or you read the news, uh, I'll believe that when I see it, okay? I, I, these viruses are very, very clever, if you want to put it that way. And this is how HIV works. This is a, a schematic. Um, HIV, uh, a key piece of that is what's called the gag polyprotein. It's a long, long protein that assembles, so this is a schematic of a cell. It assembles on the inner part of the cell membrane in this kind of assembly. There's a piece of it that binds to the cell membrane. A tail takes with it the RNA of the virus, the genetic material. It assembles and starts driving one of these bubbles off of the surface of the cell. This is what's called a bud, and all that stuff is inside it. Then um, it recruits some other proteins, which we're not showing here, that cut that neck. That neck is, is cleaved, and it goes free. This is what we call the immature virion. It's not infectious at this point. It, is, um, uh, it, it hasn't matured into an infectious particle. What happens during this maturation is the HIV protease, which is another protein, which is an enzyme, starts cutting this molecule, this long molecule, in places. It starts uh, doing some clear uh, cleaving. And pieces of it, you can see the green part, encapsulate the RNA. So in this is an artist's rendition of this capsid I keep showing you, okay? This now is infectious. And this thing will target another cell it will inject this capsid into the cell, it will fall apart, and the RNA will go into the replication cycle of the cell so the, the virus replicates. So we felt that we might be able to make a difference, and, and whether we have or not, we'll let you uh, be the, the judge of that. You can see these images, it's very hard to image. These are uh, electron microscopy images of the immature one. You can sort of see the rings of these proteins. Here's a mature one. You can see that capsule in there. So we wanted to understand something about that capsule. Well, it turns out that <clears throat> from structural biology, so, so making crystals of flat crystals of this protein, they've been able to determine that it seems like this, this capsule is made up of fundamental structures. So these are pieces of proteins in a hexagon, so like a, a solid lattice with hexagon or pentagon. Uh, it turns out that depending on where you are, uh, the hexagons, sort of like graphite, have you ever seen the molecular structure of graphite? It's a flat sheet or graphene. If there's curvature, it turns out that a pentagon is better to sort of help relieve the strain from that curvature. And so from the structural biologists, even though they've never seen these structures in this virus capsid directly, from experiments they do, they've been able to determine that they are in this, they, they believe they're in this capsule. So this is a, a model I'll show you about in a minute. Uh, you see in the middle of that circle, there's a hexagon there. We've colored the pentagons red just so you can see them. There's a, a pentagon. It turns out that this, this, this very important piece of this virus that, that holds on to its RNA, of course that's what is required for it to replicate, um, is in, encapsulated in here, and these high curvature regions uh, involve these pentamers, and the low curvature regions, the more flatter regions, these hexamers, the proteins. So we were able to use our methods to study this. The problem is, is that this is what a typical molecular simulation will give you. Look, so the water I showed you flopping around. Uh, that is 10 to the minus 15th seconds, so this is putting 15 zero, 14 zeros there. <clears throat> but the sort of time scale of the uh, virus is on the order of at least a second, something like that. We're off. <laughs> We're off by a long ways. So that's where these coarse grain models come in. Because the coarse grain models, and I can't go into the, the detailed theory that, that is involved in developing them, they fold much of the irrelevant time scales into the model, okay? It's a far more sophisticated form of molecular modeling than just building a simple atomic model. 
But at the end of the day, we were able to do a coarse grain model of all of these proteins and, and uh, uh, develop a, uh, a model of the capsid. I, I just show you pictures here. You can see this is one part of one of those proteins that makes up the shell. These are, this is the coarse grain model. Remember I told you what happens is we, we, we use these objects. You could think of them as quasi-particles or effective particles. They represent pieces of the protein. And there's far fewer of them than is in here. These strands, by the way, have many, many hundreds of atoms that they're representing. So we can formulate uh, a model, uh, how they interact, uh, the so-called N-terminal domain here, the C-terminal domain, how they stick together. It's very similar to water. Remember, with water, I told you that we looked at quantum mechanics. We looked at how it redistributes the charge uh, that comes from the quantum mechanics. Here, it's far more subtle than that. We're trying to understand not only how the quantum mechanics has redistributed the charge, but how these pieces of protein redistribute themselves on average into these effective structures. And having done that, then actually we, we actually, there you go. This is a, a movie of the HIV capsid incorporating, that will incorporate RNA moving. Why does it move? It's a temperature, right? It's moving. It's at uh, 308 degrees Kelvin. Um, and it's, it's got thermal motion. And you can see that it's got all of, it's stable. It's got the stable hexagons and pentagons, just as experimentalists had suggested. But what's interesting is not just that it's stable and that, in fact, we can recapitulate a model based on all this experimental data, but what we can predict with it. Remember, the scientific method is about not only, you know, taking all the facts you know and try to formulate a, a uh, a, a, th a theoretical construct that contains those, but to make new predictions, right? So what's really interesting then is what goes behind the formation of this thing? How does it assemble in the first place as that virus ma matures? Well, what we did is we were able to do some simulations. We cannot yet, we don't quite have a powerful enough computer, a powerful enough uh, set of programs to do it. Um, we can't yet fully assemble the capsid, but we can assemble pieces of its shell. You can see the green pieces here, so like these hexagons here, at different um, sorts of radii, so different sorts of uh, curvature. And you can see at, at very low curvature on this spherical surface that would be occurring like in this, this HIV uh, virus, uh, we don't have many of the, the pentagons, the red guys, we just have the hexagons. As we get higher curvature, we need more and more of these pentagons. But there's something um, new in here, and I, I'm going to give away the secret. There's some blue structures in here that hadn't been noticed before. I'm going to show you what those blue structures are in a minute. Those blue structures, uh, you, you can't see them here. Uh, I'll show you in a minute. But what they are are vertices that form where the, where the hexagons come together, sort of a, a substructure amongst the larger structure. And what we found, in fact, is that they were totally ubiquitous in the growth of these structures. They are the single most important structure. They're constantly uh, forming and dissolving, forming and dissolving. So they're what we call kinetically long-lived. They're constantly doing it. And they're always around the edges facilitating the growth of the shell. So they're always out here, out here you can see that, and it doesn't matter what the concentration. And they have a beautiful structure, it's called a trimer of dimers. So what it is is a three-fold structure, trimer, of dimers of two proteins into two, uh, in like a diatomic molecule, two proteins. So one half of the protein, or one, uh, one monomer of protein, I mean half, the other half here, green, blue there. This is the coarse grain model for it. It turns out that this is the single most, this screen went off, I hope it doesn't matter. This is the single most uh, important structure in defining not only the growth, but the stability of this HIV capsid, and it so happens. Now, I cannot take claim that we, we predicted this or that anyone even knew about us. It so happens we have learned that a pharmaceutical company has developed an inhibitor that seems to be very effective uh, at perhaps preventing age or the progression of HIV infection that binds in one of these interfaces here and disrupts this thing. Okay, so you see if you disrupt it, if you can't allow this triangular uh, thing to form, oops, you, sorry, 
you, you really will disturb the ability of this all-important encapsulated object to grow. Let me finish in the, in the last three minutes with the, the current story, which is very interesting. Um, <clears throat> we've begun to realize that, that the growth of this thing, so we want to use our computer simulation, our models, to understand the growth of these, these encapsulated RNA, this, this key virus piece that lives in these, these virus particles that go infect different cells. We've come to realize that what we had been doing was missing something. And that actually inside of here is all kinds of junk. Okay. <laughs> There's all kinds of other stuff in there. This is a picture of just our best estimate of what else is in there. And I don't know if any of you have been paying attention to, to even some of the artwork, but in a cell, this is not a cell, this is a substructure. In a cell, there's all kinds of incredible amount of stuff in there. They call this the, the crowded environment. There's proteins, membranes, organelles, uh, you know, everything. It's incredibly crowded in there. And how nature actually organizes to uh, thrive in that kind of environment is beyond. It's like trying to go out here in the traffic and, and do better than if you didn't have the traffic. Okay? Well, it turns out, we, my postdoc, John, who's in this audience, one of the best people I can imagine, he's been beating his head against the wall trying to do the full assembly of these capsids, you know, with our models. And he certainly has gotten part of the way and discovered these things, but he had a lot of trouble uh, making it happen. He realized that, you know, it's very, very crowded in there. And so we have to include this stuff. Now, what that does, to get slightly technical, uh, one of the strongest forces in nature is entropy. Entropy means all kinds of possibilities, right? Entropy is disorder. When you crowd an environment, you make it more crowded, you take away entropy because you, you, there's only so much. I mean, it seems to add entropy by putting a lot of that stuff in there, but the objects you're looking at have less freedom. So they have to correspond, do something to correspond. What they may do is aggregate, all right? And so what we found is that if we duplicate those conditions, I'll show you a couple of movies. These are all of our little proteins and then we're trying to assemble to get this capsid to grow in our computer simulation. And these plots show how many of the contacts in forming that, that lattice uh, are forming as a function of crowding. So the, this FICOL, actually in vitro, you can do experiments that are, that are similar. You put these agents in that crowd. They just crowd, they just take up space. And you can see that in the low concentration, which is the red, nothing really happens. This is, a, again, a computer simulation. They're just, these are the, the important proteins. They're just moving around in there. They never really associate that much. Sometimes they do. They seem to accelerate. I don't believe that's real. Um, every now and then a computer simulation uh, gives us something that's not quite right. This, though, is the crowded one. This is where we are at 250 milligrams per milliliter of this FICOL. It's like a polymer. It crowds. Now we see something interesting. You will start seeing the shell forming. Of, and we're not showing all the other stuff in there, but you see the shell beginning to form of the HIV virus capsid. So what we believe, uh, quite possibly, is that in fact, this all-important capsid going back this thing, all right, which if you build a nice little model for it, looks like this thing, is not this armor-plated rock-solid thing. You know, it looks like you could hit it with a baseball bat. It would, it's incredibly metastable, all right, and it's only living because it's in a very crowded environment in this little virus particle, and it is responding to that crowdedness. And in fact, when I'm, I always go backward in my talks because I, uh, just a minute, when it gets injected, so if this is kind of metastable, when that goes to a new cell and gets injected, it's, it's, it's certainly in a crowded environment still, but not as crowded. And so that may be why it just uncoats. It's been a big mystery in HIV. Uh, in other viruses, there's chemical changes of these proteins that cause uncoating. Um, acid, uh, usually acidification. HIV doesn't use it. It's been a mis big mystery of... Uh, why it does that? It may be as simple as that this is a very metastable thing that lives because it's in that environment, okay? If you, very hard to form them outside of there. And uh, once it goes in, it's in a new environment, just dissolves. So uh, this 
is it really interesting? I mean, I can't say that we completely discovered this with computer simulation. Uh, I think experimentalists had kind of been thinking about this because they have such a hard time forming these things uh, when they're not in their natural environment. But that's, uh, that's what we go. So let me finish up. I'm just a couple of minutes over. I've got to kill my movies if they're be. Um, is um, where we're headed now is really try to do the whole thing, the whole uh, HIV virion. That means the whole particle the whole maturation to a model, the formation, the, the cleavage, to do the whole modeling. And you'd have to admit that, you know, 50 years after Rachman did the liquid argon, to be able to model uh, HIV virus is a big step forward. I think that we've come a long ways. It didn't come, it did not come, just from faster computers. I cannot emphasize that if it came a combination of ideas, of theory, of the ability to do uh, what we do, which is quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, to put all that together with our powerful computers to be able to do all of these uh, beautiful, beautiful sorts of things. We may get up to this level someday. Okay, so I will finish. This is the, I hope I'll finish, movies. There we go. This is the uh, of course, I mentioned the National Science Foundation has funded our center, and we hope it will continue. We compete next year for a phase two, which will grow the budget by, uh, uh, if Congress doesn't uh, sequester it away from us, uh, uh, by almost a factor of 10. These are the initial people you can see me. Actually, the same outfit. I, I hate to tell you, it's the only outfit I have that looks like this. And um, some, some of my faculty co-workers, co and most importantly, wonderful uh, postdocs and graduate students. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope uh, I didn't get too technical. I wanted to give you a feeling of how far this field has come in you know, sort of 50 years, uh, which is a long ways. And I suspect in the next 10 to 20 years, you'll be amazed to see where it goes. So um, thank you very much. Sure. So uh, yeah. if you wouldn't mind just repeating the questions yeah. as they are asked, uh, and uh, yeah, 10 minutes for that, and, and then maybe an informal discussion with you afterwards if anybody wants to yeah, that would be really fine. get deep. So. Yeah. They're besmerized. Questions? Yeah. What you do is simulation. How do you actually look at what you simulate? Yeah, so his question, his, that's a very good point. His, his point is uh, that we're doing a simulation. What do we, how do we know that it's what actually happens? Because we then collaborate with our experimental colleagues. We make predictions, and they go m measure those predictions. It's very difficult. You know, they're not going to uh, take an image that shows those things moving that way. But what I can do is I can say, okay, if you mutate these amino acids to different amino acids, this thing will fall apart or it'll do this. Um, this other kind of structure exists, so the structural biologist might look for that. That's the other part of the scientific method. Any theory or simulation that lives in its own world, not connected to the experiments, is, is uh, not of much value, right? And there is some of that, right? Some people get so infatuated with their simulations, they forget <laughs> to work with experimentalists. This particular, uh, actually this center, we have a number of experimental collaborators, but that HIV thing is a part of a big NIH project, and I'm the only theorist and simulator. All the rest are experimentalists. So, so you absolutely, verification by experiment, basically. Can I ask another? Sure, yeah. Who comes first? Well, there's a bit of it. So his question is, who comes first, the theory versus the experiment? A, bit, a little bit of a cart versus horse argument there. I mean, you know, uh, you have to, tr you could, uh, you know, it goes back to the, to the Greeks, I guess. But um, in biology, or, you know, where we are working a lot, almost always the experimental results generate the questions, okay? Uh, generally speaking, you know, there's all these facts about HIV or something that you have out there and you start building your model and then you make new predictions and go back. In, in more physics and more pure physics, I'm sure everybody knows that often theorists, uh, with, you, you never, there is no such thing as a theory without some experimental facts, right? We wouldn't have quantum mechanics if there weren't facts that made us have quantum mechanics. 
But more often in physics, there will be a body of theory that grows in sort of almost a pure form and that predicts something, let's say superconductivity or some very, you know, and then it is measured. And in, in particle theory, you know, uh, very high energy physics, which I am not an expert at, uh, and, and even they've been criticized a little bit, that the theory kind of lives by itself and predicts things, and they just think they found the Higgs boson, which took many, many years to confirm a theory that had predicted it. So uh, as you get more towards the fundamental side, more towards the physical side, the theory uh, is the beginning. As you go more to the biology, the experiment is the beginning. But I would argue that working together is, is the real key. So, yeah. Now you have a question. I read that, that in the one study in nature, they're trying to scale down the uh, nuclear magnetic resonance and the, and the magnetic energy down to a molecular level. You have to go in and out. So there's an, his question was that he had, he had read that they were trying to scale down nuclear magnetic resonance to sort of the molecular level, so you actually see those movies you know, in reality. Um, they're just in the beginning stage. They're in the beginning stage, and it's not just NMR. Uh, I think electron scattering, electron diffraction, and X-ray diffraction that are used for static pictures, they're trying to do what we call real-time versions of that, so you would actually see motion. Right, right, yeah. So um, there's, uh, in, in imaging, which uh, there's these techniques that are called super resolution imaging, they're, they're beginning to you know, get time, time domain is what we call, so there's spatial domain, meaning you're looking at something, and there's time domain that you can watch it move. And I, I think that within really a fairly short period of time, you will see actual uh, experimental movies, like what I showed you of some protein moving maybe not with femtosecond time resolution, but the, the very slow motions you'll actually see. And I think that's coming. And that's, in answering your question, that will be fantastic because it will be a direct experimental measurement of what we might be predicting. You know, if we predict a protein moves like this, and that's important for how it behaves, and you see that happening, then that will be very important. Now we have to infer it. We say, okay, if you do a cross-linking and stop that motion, the protein will quit behaving like it should, and you'll get it'll quit functioning and, and they can do that. But to see it would be really important. And that's coming. I, I, th I think it's coming. Not, not at the, you know, this level will always stay out there because we can solve fundamental equations and give a higher fidelity than, than they can. So. Yeah. I see. Uh -huh. uh, there's, there's, there's also um, perhaps uh, I like that Okay, you're, you're listing a lot of complicated stuff. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that computer, the computer modeling is, so his, his point is he was talking about different targets you might have for HIV therapy, and computer modeling could help uh, predict some possibilities there. Uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, using computers to predict new drugs is a very common place thing. So uh, uh, your traditional drug is just a small molecule that binds and inhibits a, a key protein from doing something. And so all that matters, I should say all, is the uh, what we call the free energy of binding, how much it likes to bind to that. 
and so there's lots of very advanced programs for picking uh, targets. And then that reduces the time that the experimentalists in pharma have to spend searching for things. So if you can take a vast range of possibilities and use computing to uh, lim you know, limit that down to, I don't know, 10 good targets, that, that saves you a lot of money. What you were talking about is even more complex things. We, we think of antibodies or you know, more complex molecules, and, and we're headed that way. I have a collaboration with Genentech on their uh, antibody anti-cancer solutions. Using some of these techniques, it turns out when they modify these antibodies, they have very unpredictable behavior of aggregating and becoming useless because you want them very concentrated for delivery, but if they've aggregated, you can't inject that or, or whatever they deliver it. So trying to understand how proteins associate with each other is, is a key target for this kind of work. Yeah. 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 So his question is, um, what's our starting point for some of these calculations? Do we start with the final object and understand it, or do we start with, you know, uh, motifs that are part of? We so the answer is yes to all. <laughs> In other words, uh, often, uh, I mean, if experimentalists had built a model for that capsule, the capsid, and our model couldn't recapitulate that, and if it just fell apart, that would be bad. So we have to be able to. That's one limit. At the other limit, we need to start from nothing and see if it will assemble. That's this last mystery I was telling you about. And then there's stuff in between. So uh, we try to start from every point we can. There's a, a myth of this kind of work that it, it's somehow going to be first principles, like you just let the computer go and uh, it'll give you the right answer. That, that, I'm, I've not seen that ever happen. Um, no, maybe for a very simple system. Generally, you have to take insight, and in, in of course, the boundary between insight and massaging your results is a difficult boundary. You have to be careful that you're doing it objectively and things like that. But, but to answer your questions, we start from all those and try to build a consistent picture. Yeah. All starting points, I should say. <laughs> Mapping the brain. Yeah, I tell you, um, even a single neuron, so that the, I very quickly went over this endocytosis business, which is very important in synaptic uh, junctions and stuff. And the brain is a humbling, because this is supposed to be some big new initiative in the government. Um, right. Whether it, it goes or not with the budget problems, we don't know. but. I think that's a, a, a laudatory goal. I'm, I'm a, a personally, we get off into philosophy. I struggle between big science and little science. You know, I, I tend to have had the best advances in my career come from little science, me working with one graduate student, just because it's kind of like the small businessman versus the big businessman. It's like somehow the, the genesis of creativity is sometimes in very small places and just thinking. The more people working together, the more tension, the more pressure, the more uh, superficiality because you're chasing big money. You're a director of a lab. You know how it, or how it is when, big, when the numbers go up, uh, the politics and things like that. So it, it's a challenge to do these. But the center of ours is sort of in between. You know, if we're lucky, it'll go up to 4 or $5 million a year, and that will fund a, a really good nucleus of people. And so, so, but I got off the topic of... Um, Mapping the brain would be pretty amazing. And I think it would also bootstrap a lot of fundamental knowledge. Um, yes? Um, so his question is a, is a wonderful question that is, is computer modeling simulation being uh, used to try to understand origin of life, some of the first things. Um, to answer your question, yes and no, in some sense, we always are, are looking at the most elemental process when we build our models. We tend to be pushed by pressures to, to, to go tr treat HIV or you know something that's here and now. 
But this question of origin of life, you know, uh, is, is an amazing question of how there was the first peptide synthesis, you know, was there an RNA world? Um, in principle, I, because it's also very difficult to duplicate those conditions now, s computing and simulation could be very important. I, I'd have to tell you honestly, I'm not aware of anyone working on that particular problem doing this kind of stuff. And part of it's our funding stream. I mean, it's not, you know, this is, this is the gov I'm not aware of any big government project that will fund understanding the origin of life like HIV infections, you see. This is an IH grant, you know, it, we're, we could all die from something, and, and that's a, a very important question, the origin of life, and the, the little bit I've studied it, uh, it's probably one of the most fascinating things I've studied myself, is to try to figure out how we got to where we are, right, and the differentiation of these functions. You should go talk to the administration, and, and they should give us lots of millions of dollars to do that, I think it'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> That's a different origin of life. <laughs> that, that kind of simulation, I don't know if we could do that one. <laughs> we better not get off into that topic too much. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Those are easy simulations. That's where you go like that and stuff happens really quickly. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much and be happy to talk to you.